Well, good evening, all. Good evening. Good evening. I think I won't tarry too much because I'm, I'm told rain is on the way and it's cold out there. So the sooner we finish, the less likely you are to get rainy and cold. So, <laughs> so blessings and, and good evening. Um, let me just say this before we start the class formally. Some of you have heard, some of you have not. Our brother Earl Gale was called to um, God's glory Sunday morning about 9.15. Um, so our sister Jan is with her two sons and one grandson as we speak. So keep her in your prayers. Um, it's a tough time. Uh, yeah, you're, for a lot of reasons, it's a tough time. Yeah. I'm sorry? Was he sick? Um, <laughs> the answer is very complex. Um, he's been struggling with his health for quite some time. Um, on Friday, before he died, he was doing great. He was set home. He was making plans for all the things that he and Jan were going to do together. And then all of us, within three hours of making those plans, he, he needed an ambulance ride to come back in, into town to the hospital. They live out in the East Mountains. Um, and, uh, just one of those things. It's just, it wasn't what he was being treated for at the hospital. It was just an absolute surprise. Mm. So, um, it hits Jan like a ton of bricks because she was ready for those big plans. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So as, as you would expect. So, but anyhow, prayers for her. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough time. All right. Okay. Nancy, you can start the recording right here. Oh. The other Nancy. <laughs> See, Nancy Wong right. listens to and cuts off all this stuff at the beginning. It oh, starts yeah. when I start. She does. So you're not, your jokes are not up there for posterity. Okay. All righty. I will talk to her. Anyhow, here we go. Here we go. There we are. Anyhow, here are the slides I show each and every time. You've all seen these. I think everybody's seen these before. Um, uh, this will be available probably tomorrow about noon. Nancy's getting real quick and real good about these nowadays, so I thank her for that. Um, and then uh, we don't have any Zoom uh, users at the moment, but if any come along, you've already heard me say, uh, push the mute button until you're ready to talk. Have a nice evening. Uh, let's see here. Um, this class is, is going to be, uh, for some, difficult to hear, perhaps. Um, and I'll say something about that in just a moment. So if at any point you have something to say, anything to question, um, anything you, you want to vent on, please don't stop. Please do that. And uh, after the prayer, let me tell you why that might be. Just generally, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm just going to say some people might find some of the text this evening offensive and uh and that depends on your life experience when you you come to that part of the text the lord be with you let us pray lord god be with our sister jan as she grieves this night and be with her family as well uh, may they draw strength and comfort from you in the days ahead and may they have the sure and certain hope that uh, that uh, earl with all the saints is gathered around your throne in the highest heaven, your throne that you share with the Lamb. And Lord God, be with all of us this evening as we study these very same concepts all these 2,000 years as they, after they were laid down, so that we too have that sure and certain hope and carry that hope with us each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, let me just say this. Um, Tonight's text, some of you have read ahead, some of you have not. It, it matters not. I'm going to read the whole text for you. Um, there are sections of the text that may well be quite offensive to modern women. Just depends. Depends on how you read it and how you, you view it. Um, and, and you're entitled to have that view because, after all, your, your life has given you certain experiences and you, you come to certain views in your life, and uh, you may find that in these in this text, and you're entitled to that. Um, men may not see it the same way. Other women may not see it the same way. Um, but as, as, as John says often, 
let those who have ears to hear listen. Well, we don't all have the same ears, right? Sure. They're not all connected to the same brain. So we will come to different meanings when we see different texts. And there are some here that, that concern many women. And I'll, I'll talk about those as I go. All right. All right. Last time, which was last week, um, we had chapter 13 before us, right? And we remember the two great beasts that came up um, onto the scene, if you will. And they join the dragon or the representation of Satan. So as those two uh, join with the dragon and do the dragon's dirty work for him, if you will, the three together form something of a trinity. Some call it the unholy trinity, some the counterfeit trinity. But these three are, are going to be present with us in, in much of the text that comes in the, in the uh, chapters that followed last time. Um, we remember that that first beast rose up out of the sea, right, and is given power by Satan, power to rule. Um, we remember that the Romans themselves came into the area where John lived, in modern-day Turkey, and into the areas around Jerusalem, all of Israel and, and other places. They came by sea. They came in boats. So this little metaphor of the, of the one that comes from the sea makes perfect sense when you're thinking about Rome. And so this beast, this first one, represents the leadership, if you will, of the Roman Empire. And of course, that's Caesar. And we think Domitian in this time frame. And a lot of the other things that, that are pointers in John's text would also seem to point strongly to Caesar Domitian. So this, this first beast, like Rome itself, rules over, the quote from my translation was, every tribe, people, language, and nation. And from John's perspective, that's exactly what Rome did in the world in which he lived in, around the Mediterranean. The second beast comes up out of the land. It's more, oh, what do you want to say? Generic. It's more homegrown. But it, it does what, the, it makes sure that what the first beast wants done gets done. So if the first beast is Caesar and the rulers, of uh, perhaps the, the Senate as well, then the second beast is the local functionaries, politicians, um, military members, tax collectors, and uh, add to that the uh, Roman uh, imperial cultic priests. It's time to worship the emperor, Caesar. We see to it that you worship Caesar and that you, you participate in the given uh, festival. So the second beast is really a whole lump of people um, that enforce the rule of Rome out in the hinterlands, right? And the, the estimate I read was it took roughly 30,000 Roman employees, if you will, to administer Rome in its, in its heyday. 30,000 people that were out and about, you know, as tax collectors and all those other things. Um, I think they were pretty efficient. <laughs> it, it takes now um, well over 3 million to do that for the U.S. federal government. Um, you get the idea. Governments always need the functionaries to make sure that what's uh, decreed on high happens. Um, and the description of this one I found fascinating because it was described as having horns like a lamb or ram, depending on your translation, because the word is the same in ancient Greek for both. So some translators go one way and some go the other. But it looks like the lamb of God, although a very false lamb of God. It speaks with a voice of a dragon, right? So it, it speaks with Satan's voice, Satan's words, but it it looks like the Lamb of God, sort of like Satan in sheep's clothing, if you will. Okay, and then at the end of what we talked about last time was that number 666, the mark of the beast that uh, people carry, and we've heard about that for many, many years, um, sometimes blown up in a different context. Um, or into a different meaning that actually isn't in the Bible. But uh, this, that number six, is a symbol of imperfection. Because seven, God's, uh, the num God's number is three, the human number is four. Put them together. That's the confluence of heaven and earth, or the divine number, if you will. Six falls short of that. Falls short of seven. <clears throat> um, and then when you triple it, six, 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 it's, it's, uh, something that's striving to take the place of God, but never quite makes it. 
then the mark of the beast, the mark of Satan makes sense with that number. But it also makes sense in another way. Um, uh, Caesar Nero um, actually had his name inscribed in two different ways. One way had a final N on it, Neron Caesar. And if you add up in, in uh, Hebrew letters, not Roman numerals, but Hebrew numerals, it works very similarly, you get the number 666 with that name and the word Caesar included. If you leave the N off, like most of us talk about historically, you get 616, and we have translations of both of those in our modern Bibles. We find um, bits of, of this passage in Revelation in the ancient times. One has one number, one has another number. Most have 666, a few have 616. We can't find any other names that would satisfy both texts of Revelation, ancient texts, and, and still point to this. So, so why Nero? Well, it was a myth about Nero. He was struck dead like one of the heads of the seven-headed um, beast number one, but he was struck dead by a sword. But it, the rumor was, or the myth was, that he was going to rise from the dead in some fashion. And so people were always worried that Nero would come back in some way. Well, Domitian and Nero were the two great persecutors of the Christian church. Nero, because Rome burned, remember Nero fiddled while Rome burned, and then Nero blamed the burning of Rome on the Christians and persecuted them. Not every Caesar persecuted Christians, but Nero was the worst to this point, and Domitian uh, was working on being every bit as bad. So, in John's mind, it would appear um, Domitian is the second rise of Nero. Okay. So the way to put that together. All right. Mm -hmm. and then I made some comments just to wrap up last time. I think, um, I think human beings um, always seek one that is, is far surpassing of themselves, and they wish to worship that, mm -hmm. that one. That's why we've had gods, little g, throughout history, right? If if we didn't know of the true God, we, we made our own God. Golden calves, whatever it is, right? They just jump out of the flames somehow, we say. But uh, there's we are always looking for one that has absolute power, well beyond the human imagination. And John would say, look, if you're not going to worship the true God, don't make a God out of any Caesar or any government or any earthly power. No such entity deserves your allegiance, especially not your ultimate allegiance. God deserves that. Only the true God deserves that. And so Revelation, as it's composed, stands as a declaration that uh, you must not be following idolatrous powers in uh in our world just must resist it and push away okay now i did point out last time too that that paul's paul wrote passages that luther adhered to that said god gave you leaders in government that, that you honor them and those two things stand in tension um sometimes one applies and sometimes the other applies and it takes some discernment some wisdom gained as to which one is right for your own time and your own circumstances. All right. So that's where we were last time. Any any questions or thoughts about last time before we move on? Yes, John. Is it true that uh, there, there's a lot of, I don't know if it's just who, is there groups or whatever that still believe that 666 is evil? Well, 666 denotes evil. I mean, there's nothing evil about the number itself, but that's the mark of the beast. But there, right. but there is are there groups that practice that? Well, I there may be. I don't know of one. We'll have another number a little later this evening, uh, one hundred and forty-four thousand, where there are some groups that uh, yeah, that make use I of that number. Remind you that, that the Navajos here in New Mexico had that highway between Farmington and Durango. Oh, yeah. re renamed. Right, it's no longer the highway number 666. People get superstitious about numbers quite a bit, right? There are buildings that don't have a 13th floor. 
There used to be aircraft that didn't have a 13th row. And those things have sort of faded away over time. And 666 sort of falls in that category. Our blue hymnals have a hymn number 666 in it. Um, you know, and people were real nervous when that blue hymnal came out about that. It's it, Those are superstitious things. But in the context that John has, that number denotes the mark of the beast. And it's it's not a literal number, but it's something to be aware of. You know, it's it's the mark of less than God godliness. Okay. Okay, tonight we're going to go through uh, Revelation 14. And uh, let me just give you a heads up on a few things. Um, there are three scenes, so I'll read three blocks of text, and we'll we'll talk about each of the three. And they're sort of connected and sort of not, but that's how John does things. He has visions, and that's like dreams. He just puts them together one after the other. Um, and after we heard, heard about those beasts last time, and... and and their master, the uh, Satan, the dragon, having been cast down out of heaven and thrown to the earth, you've got all three of them thrashing around. And, and you have to wonder, for the people left on earth, how do you survive all of that, right? Um, will we survive all of that? And so chapter 14, especially in the early parts of it, are meant to reassure the people of earth that it's going to be all right. Yeah, you're going to have a lot of bumps and bruises and worse. But God has this under control. That that reassurance is there for the faithful. Um, and it's needed. Boy, is it needed. Again, you've got the beasts of Rome with Satan informing them of how to go about their business. And that's, that's a frightening thing for people in John's time, to be sure. Um, where do you get comfort? Where do you get comfort? And again, that's a lot of what John intends. I did make a comment earlier that, that some of us may find something other than comfort in, in these words as we go through them. And I'll, I'm, I'm not going to soft soap it. I'm just going to point, point it out and say some people will struggle with these words. But chapters 12 and 13 have been pretty brutal. And it turns out 14 will have its own brutality meant to be taken a different way. But um. So I asked this question last time, if this unholy trinity is here among us, and in John's telling, it still is, right? The, the beast of, of false government, the beast of false religion, that's beast one and beast two, with Satan behind the scenes driving both of them. Those things still exist now. They have different names, different shapes, but the beasts are still among us, right? In John's teaching. All right. Let's look at the first five verses, the first of those three scenes. Okay. Ah, John writes, Then I looked, and here was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now we know what the mark is, right? The name of the Lamb and the name of the Father. I also heard a sound coming out of heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. Now the sound I heard was like that made by harpists playing their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. No one was able to learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from humanity as first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and no lie was found on their lips. They are blameless. First fruits would indicate they're the first ones, but God has many more to be called into the group, right? Now, that's one way to take it. It's a little rougher after that. So the Lamb. Jesus Christ stands on Mount Zion. Mount Zion um, initially was the mount where the temple in Jerusalem was built. In modern day understanding, Mount Zion is not quite there. It's off to the west a little bit. Um, so the definition of Mount Zion has changed over the many centuries. But initially it was right where the temple was put, where God touched the earth, if you think of it that way, where God dwelled in that temple, right? And he has 144,000 of the faithful around him, 
So when anybody want to speak up and tell us what you remember of the number of 144 or 144,000? Anything come to mind? Isn't it kind of like perfection, 12 times 12? Yeah, 12, 12 is the number of completeness, which isn't really a word, but that's the understanding in, in the ancient times. And 12 times 12 gives you 144. Um, and in the Jewish way of thinking, you can intensify that by adding zeros behind it. So it's really, really complete. It's a whole bunch of people, right? It's not a literal number taken like an accountant would take it. Okay. But they're all, uh, it was an earlier picture I had up here. They're all gathered around the throne, around the lamb. They're all singing. It's a, it's a time of great joy. It's a, it's a time of ease. It's a rest in peace sort of picture. Um, that's how this, this, part of revelation start, starts out and again we need that after the previous two chapters it's a symbolic number right it is meant to represent all the faithful now we'll get to the words that surround that in just a moment because it, it might lead you to believe something else but that's what one hundred and forty-four thousand, as steve points out that's exactly what that's supposed to be it's this completeness of, of god's calling all those who should have been called right Here's some of the words. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. I'm going to have a lot to say about that for that sentence as we go through the evening. Um, but does that mean literally there's only men there? No women in heaven? You can have a fight on your hands. Well, you that's it. I mean. That one. <laughs> and I, I made that comment early on. Depends on your background and how you know you perceive things. Growing up two thousand years after this text was laid down, some women I've I've got quotes from women theologians who find great trouble with just that, right? And even then, it's it's not all men. It's only those men who've never engaged in sexual intercourse. Is that to be taken literally, any of that? But but it's still, it can be offensive because we have our own prejudices and we have our own way of our minds working and the way we've grown up. But John doesn't write anything literally, not beasts, not dragons, none of that, or this, or the 144,000 for that matter. You know, when I read this, I, let me lighten the mood a little bit. I went to the University of Florida for my engineering degree a long, long time ago. And in the middle of the university campus is this gorgeous bell tower. It's called Century Tower. It's red brick a facade, stands beautifully high above the main classroom buildings. And there was a legend that went with that, with that tower. The legend among the students was for every virgin that graduated from the University of Florida, one brick would fall off the tower. It was pristine, right? <laughs> Right. And so I read this and I went, uh, what are the odds of finding 144,000? Right. Yeah. In any event, this is this is not meant to be taken literally, taken literally, excuse me. But still, you know, it, it, this and other phrases can cause uh, women pause. And we have to acknowledge that we must. Uh, since we don't take 144,000 literally. How can we take these other gender sex things that come up literally, like being a virgin and so on? So on. Yes, John. Can how mistaken are you when you read this? You just assume it's God and He's talking about everybody. He well, may and, say virgin, or He may say all this other, but you just I automatically assumed. And he's already he's just talking about everybody. And that's with my male eyes, I see that. That's what 144,000 tells me, as, as Steve was pointing out. It's this great inclusive everybody, as John points to in other places, male and female, slave and free and all the rest, right? It's all. But these other things, you know, not defiled by with women and, and virgins and so on, sort of startles you. It sounds like you're whittling down the human population, or is he? Again, it depends on, on how you consume that, right? 
there are some Old Testament conventions, right? If as a Christian or as a Jew, you know, Old Testament, I went out and I messed around with some pagan religion down the street, I would be labeled a fornicator or an adulterer, right? And think about it. Uh, in Christian terms, we think about the bride of Christ, which is the church, right? And the groom is Christ himself. So as the bride of Christ, I'm a member of that. I go off and I mess around with some pagan cult over there. I am cheating on Jesus. That makes me an adulterer, right? So the sexual language is talking about the way people interact with the true God versus the not true God. Certainly John intends that, but again, with our modernized ears, we don't always perceive that or, or we can't accept that in some cases. And, and that doesn't make it bad. But my dalliance with that other God over there makes me a fornicator in the biblical understanding of these words used multiple ways. It, it means the same thing if you cheat on your marriage, right? But if you cheat on your God, those same words are applied. But when you when you don't really think about that, you just assume you're talking about everybody and their mistake. Right, which is why, now when you put these things together, the 144,000, the many, the everybody that are around the throne of God are those who have resisted the sexy allure of running off with other small g gods, right? Especially in John's case, we're not messing with that Roman imperial cult. Okay? We haven't been fornicators or adulterers with them. Right? Um, there's also an ancient military tradition, right? Anybody remember the story of David, Bathsheba, and Uriah? Right? I'll, I'll just do you a quick rundown. David um, looks out of his palace in Jerusalem one day, sees Bathsheba, she's taken a bath, he is taken with her beauty, right? Problem is, she's married. But in any event, um, he seduces her, and in short order, she's expecting a child. Now, this is a problem for David, uh, because he doesn't wish to be identified as king adulterer. So he summons Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, who is a military officer who works for David. He's off on the war front. He summons him back into Jerusalem and uh, he, he talks with him for a little while and says, why don't you go home and spend time with your wife? Thinking he would have relations with his wife and then it could be said it was Uriah's child, not David's. Problem was Uriah was a good military officer for his time. His troops and, and fellows, um, Comrades couldn't have sex with their wives, so he wouldn't either, right? Um, and that was part of the ancient military thinking. Military men, if they had sexual relations with their wives, would not perform well in war, so they thought. We laugh, right? I'm old enough to have played a little bit of high school football. And in my time, our coach would tell us, you go off in a dalliance with a young lady before a football game, you won't play well. Stay away from that. I think he was really trying to tell us something else, but that's what he told us, right? But that comes back from ancient times for warriors, right? So these kinds of things, I saw some men shaking their heads up and down. I won't point any elbows or fingers, but yeah, that was a thing in our youth. And it was a thing in, in John's time and well before, all the way back to at least David's time. Uh, so David had to have Uriah, short of that, David had to have Uriah killed at the battle so that now he was free to marry uh, Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. So that's how that story went down. So John pulls on that. These are ones that are about to get into the spiritual battle of, of the real God versus the unholy trinity, right? And uh, eh, they're not, spiritually speaking, engaged in... in sexual relations they're keeping themselves ready for battle in, in that ancient way of thinking um and again these these kinds of words are hard to take if you just put your modern values to them they can be very hard to take and very off-putting and let us 
not in any way denigrate anybody if you happen to feel that way. It's it's true. It just is. And this is preparing for continuance of living in the great. Situation. Say good. This is in the context is the hundred forty four thousand do are universally all those that are living through the great tribulation, correct? The tribulation to come, yes. The tribulation to come or the tribulation that is... Uh, he's preparing them for the tribulation. Right, they're they're preparing to go to battle, spiritual battle. Let's, let's just... I, I, I don't know what it is, but if you go to Luke, Luke, or I'm sorry, Matthew 24, 19. Right. Christ is speaking about the great tribulation. And he says, and woe unto them that are with child and to them that gave suck in those days. I think it confuses me greatly. <laughs> and here's, here's the parable that Christ saying, cool it, don't have any children because this thing's going to be so bad. You're not going to want to have any children. Well, you know, those, those are who are giving birth, right, are vulnerable. And Who yeah, the, it's, I'm sorry. Where did you say that? It's in Luke's gospel. So oh, those Matthew's, Matthew's, Matthew's excuse me, I misunderstood. Matthew's yeah, gospel. Yeah, I, I said Luke first. It was, it's Matthew 24, 19. Right. So, you know, those who are uh, struggling with any medical condition, including giving birth, are going to be vulnerable when the upheaval happens. So in this context, it may be just a warning that hey, you might want to forego having children because it's going to be pretty bad. And well, perhaps, perhaps. I don't want to put words in his yeah. mouth because he also tells us in another place, you don't know when this is going to happen. Right. right? So all these things play together. And, and, and it, the perfect picture of what it looks like when Christ comes again is not available to us. We get we get these obscure snapshots that just basically give us messages behind them. So get ready. If you think sequentially, great tribulation has not yet occurred. If we in in so, John's telling now, what John is telling us has not yet occurred. <laughs> right, prophecy. right, but it's it's on the doorstep. Right, it's coming. It's coming. He keeps telling us, telling us it's coming. The defeat of the dragon and his two sidekicks is coming. Well, is that Matthew just saying that, or is it supposed that's, to be that's Matthew. Jesus telling me to say that? That's Matthew's quoting Jesus. Uh, if, if you had a Bible, it would be in red. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For those that still do that. According to Matthew. All righty. Thank you. Kind of, you know, sure. Yes, see, Steve. Since this come up, I always thought that passage of Matthew was a. Uh, a good argument against the rapture? Well, <laughs> yeah, even the rapture is a guess at what this, I mean, I think the rapture, as as w when we get to that kind of, those wordings, there are messages behind it, you know, just like there's messages behind these numbers. Um, rather than a literal, this is how it's going to happen, and, and as CT says, this is the sequence. I don't think we can predict the sequence. The sequence will help us understand, but it won't. It isn't a, a a historical account before history happens, if that makes sense. What would is there? I think I would need to read that in Matthew myself. Okay, well let's let's finish Steve's question. I was just wondering for. Uh, is there any? Lutheran teachings that you're aware of in the church that would say that, you know, this pre trib, post trib uh, idea concerning the rapture is ill thought out or ill interpreted? What, what's... I don't know that we get as specific as to say the pre post. Trib tribulation um, concepts that some espouse are ill thought out. I, I don't think we use exactly those words. Rather, um, we fall back on, on Luther's teaching now 500 years old. Um, the way to best prepare for the rapture, the best, the best way to prepare for Christ's second coming, let me put it that way, yeah. is, is simply to do the things Christ has called you to do. 
Luther's quote was, I, when Christ comes again, I want him to find me planting a tree. A it's a, tree. <laughs> well, but it's, it's a perfectly useless act at that moment. But it's what it's emblematic of what Christ would call us to do, to make the world a better place moment by moment and day by day. Um, and so that that tends to be the preponderance of Lutheran teaching is, is not to worry about, you know, what happens before, after or during, but rather just prepare for the coming because, you know, not when it happens. And the best way to prepare is to follow Christ's teaching. Do it. Don't just read it. Do it. Live it. So, so that well, that's the Lutheran legacy. Lutherans don't believe in the rapture. We you don't teach it. We certainly don't coming? teach it. Yeah, we absolutely believe in the second coming. We don't spend a lot of time teaching the rapture and and tribulation pre and post and all that kind of stuff because it's it's just it doesn't serve anything in my in, in Lutheran opinion and it's my opinion. Um, if if you could accurately and perfectly predict the future, which is what you're doing with all that, uh, what would be the purpose? You, would you recognize it when you saw it? Well, I think you know? that was the point that they're hoping that you will, that you will be aware of your surroundings and the times. Sure. But I mean, as far as I know, this the whole rapture thing is dispensationalism, which was from... <laughs> Darby, remember the guy who's meeting in the 1800s. So it is a fairly recent doctrine. Right. And it, 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 it tends to be taught more in other forms of churches that have a little less history here and there. But uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from what we're, we're seeing here. But that's not to say we take these things literally any more than exactly 144,000 people or exactly the Mark 666 or any of those kinds of things that, that we find here. Um, but rather, there's meaning behind that, just as there was in the Garden of Eden, you know, and, and God creating in six days. There's meaning behind that, not literalism dominant. The Bible has literal places that we must take literally. Thou shalt not murder. We can take that literally, right? And it has other places where it speaks in parables. Jesus famously offered us a number of parables. Sometimes we don't know which one it is. But in any event, there's always meaning there for us to learn and to help us prepare. I think we've been in the end of times for roughly 2,000 years. You know, since the moment Christ told, told us he's coming again. The early people thought it was coming, excuse me, any day. And, and we still think that. We look at the world as they did 2,000 years ago, and we see a mess that only God can make right. And that's been true for 2,000 years. And one day, like the thief in the night, we're going to be proven right. I can't tell you when that is, and I can't tell you how that goes down. Nor do I want to try. I'd rather take care of my grandkids and, uh, and, and you know little ones on the street than worry about that. Okay, verses 6 through 13, the, the second of the three vignettes. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead, and he had an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. No, nobody excluded this time. He declared in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has arrived, and worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed the first, declaring, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great city. She made all the nations drink of the wine of her immoral passion. A third angel followed the first two, declaring in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and takes the mark on his forehead or his hand, that person will also drink of the wine of God's <clears throat> anger that has been mixed undiluted in the cup of his wrath, and he will be tortured with fire and sulfur or brimstone in your translation, perhaps, in front of the holy angels and in front of the Lamb. And the smoke from their torture will go up forever and ever, and those who worship the beast in his image will have no rest day or night, along with anyone who receives the mark of his name. This requires the steadfast endurance of the saints, those who obey God's commandments and hold to their faith in Jesus. 
Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this. Blessed are the dead, those who die in the Lord from this moment on. Yes, says the Spirit, so they can rest from their hard work because their deeds will follow them. Okay. So again, some words of comfort there, but some words of wrath too. So remember the three-story universe that the ancients uh, knew all too well. This angel, this first angel, is flying above the people of the earth, but not all the way up into heaven. Some Bibles will call that mid-heaven, or directly overhead or in the sky, if you prefer. He has this eternal gospel to proclaim. And we, gospel is good news. This is the good news of Jesus Christ that matters at all times and in all places, right? And it's for all who live on the earth, no exception. Greek word for all is panta. Panta is all-inclusive. That's the word used here. The angel is, is making an offer. There's a deal. It's too good to be true. Anyone who hears and gives God's glory, anybody who hears this gospel and gives God's glory is going to receive it. For the hour of judgment has come. So if you want to call this the tribulation, you can, but it happens in many, many places in Revelation. Right? The hour of judgment has come. Right? So all are called to now worship God based on their receipt of this gospel, whether they were wicked before or they were faithful before. They're all called. And so in my questioning mind, is this the last chance to repent? Is this the very last minute? Remember Jesus' parable of the workers, right? Some of them worked all day and they received the payment, right? Others came at virtually the last hour and they received exactly the same payment. Is this your chance to repent and come to God at the last opportunity? And how would God react to that? We know the answer, right? We know the answer. So even at this hour, all are being invited, invited to examine their lives and worship the true God. So the second angel has some curious words. The second angel announces the fall of Babylon. If you're a student of history, you know that's mm, somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 years too late. Babylon fell in, you know, somewhere around the, the year 650, oh, excuse me, 550 um, BC. And we're at about 90 AD at this point, 90, 95. So, but consider this, what did Babylon do in its heyday? It came into Israel, it flattened the temple and all of Jerusalem, right? And it took some, not all, of the Israelites into exile. Basically, it took its leadership, cut the head off of the nation, its leaders in worship, its leaders in politics, its leaders in engineering, all those leaders it took with them and just left Israel without its head, without its brain, if you will, and without its, uh, without its inspiring centers of worship and government. They were all flattened. So... Although it's all this many years later, people who live in that part of the world remember that like it's yesterday, even though it's pushing 700 years earlier. All right. Well, what did Rome do? They marched into Jerusalem. They flattened the whole place. They flattened the temple in the year 70. Right. Again, Revelation was written, we believe, in around the year 90 to 95, somewhere in there. So you see any parallels between these two, Babylon and Rome? Rome is the new Babylon, just like Domitian is the new Nero in John's way of teaching this. Rome is the new Babylon. Now, uh, Rome didn't take exiles. They just left bodies in the streets. And there, there is that difference. But that's where John gets this language from. And then the third angel says there's going to be this eternal condemnation, what we'll later hear of the casting into the lake of fire, right? For those who insist, after being given this last chance, who insist on worshiping the dragon and its beasts, okay? Or images of these things. 
They'll be tormented by fire and brimstone or sulfur, if you like. But where else in the Old Testament do we hear about fire and brimstone or fire and sulfur? Sodom. Remember? Say again. Sodom. Yep. Sodom and Gomorrah were rained down upon with fire and brimstone. So you get the idea. God wiped out those who opposed him in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what's coming, folks, um, at this point, if you worship the beast. You know, it's kind of ironic today being retired. I, I read a lot of news to my wife's demise. But anyway, <laughs> there's a high school back east somewhere, and there's kind of a local uproar because evidently a group of people have been allowed to have a Satan club after school hours. Yep. And you know that very first uh, sentence up on the top. Yep. You know, that's kind of serious stuff when you want to start warping the minds of young people, in my opinion. Well, you, you're exactly right. And and in the modern world, if if uh if worshiping any entity that opposes God's will in the world goes on, you do that at your at your peril. And that can take the, the shape of the Satan worship that is being introduced into schools um, alongside Christmas in, yeah. in certain places. Um, but remember, that beast can take other shapes, too. And, and so be careful what gods you pick. There's only one good one. Yes. I don't mean to be hung up on sequential here, but I am. <laughs> and, uh, so the first angel comes with good news, which means the first angel brings the gospel. But right. clearly, it, unless the first angel has already come and given us the gospel, the gospel has been entrusted to us, but only entrusted to men. And, and presumably the first angel brings a new view of the gospel? No, just another announcement. Notice that first angel. It's interesting in the ancient text. The first angel is announced with another angel. Well, there hasn't been one since chapter 11. So what does this another mean? And we've been arguing about that for 2,000 years. So it, it, it's another declaration of the gospel. It's not an initial. It's not a new gospel. It is the gospel with another angel bringing it to us. The angels have been bringing it throughout human history at that point. Okay, so this is a continuation. If you, if you want to look at sequential things, John, of course, doesn't think in terms of time. He just sort of mashes all this stuff together. Okay. Some tough words here. For those who worship the beast in its image, there is no relief. Um, there's no mention of fire, but there's smoke rising from them forever and ever. Or where there's smoke, there's fire, right? Even though it wasn't specifically mentioned. So people struggle with this image, like some of the other images we talked about earlier, right? Um, but before I get to that, Let's remember who the original readers of this was. It, it wasn't the Roman masses. This was written for people who were churchgoers, faithful folks, folks like you and I in the days of John. So why would John tell people in the churches, hey, those who worship the beast and its image are going to have smoke rising from their carcasses forever and ever? Why would you tell that to the people of the church? Well, he had just said don't get involved with false gods. That's right. Yeah, if you make that choice, there are consequences. Stay true. I mean, he says that in another place in the passage I just read. Stay true, stay steadfast, endure uh, all that the world has to put before you. I remember Don't do that. I remember the line from the Lord's Prayer, and deliver us from temptation. Yes. Uh, even as Christians, we can darn sure be tempted to fool by Satan without putting me out. Oh, and we are at every turn. We are always tempted by Satan. Satan doesn't give up. And I think Satan doesn't spend a lot of time attacking people who are already going to Satan clubs. He's attacking the people of the church. That's where the, you know, the, uh, the temptations are brought. 
to people like us. And so when when some member of the church has a spectacular fall after giving in to temptation, that's why it's just so shocking to us all, right? But that's where Satan's attack is centered always on the people that are faithful. He wants to put separation between the faithful and God. Some find this passage to be pretty brutal. Um, the next one's going to be even more so. But this is God getting even or being vindictive for those who won't worship him. Some will take it that way. I don't, but some do. I was going to say, some of the current rhetoric coming out of churches hold that God is only a loving God. They don't want to talk about the fact that there are two sides to God. Well, I think there are more than two. Well, yes. God is very, very complex, yes, but, but God is not simply love. No, no, right, and and that's what and like so many. Oh, there's no no hell. There's no ultimate. So it's like they only want to talk about the good sides of God. Well, and let me deal with that a little bit here, okay? John just has nothing but symbolic language in the way he tells things. He paints pictures. That's his way of conveying meaning. And we're not used to that, but he's doing that here again. Um, and so it's not fair to try to assign literally smoke to bodies, right? He's, he's conveying a message, as, as Betsy was pointing out. Dear people of the church, don't wander off to the other gods. There are consequences to that. And how does that how do those consequences manifest themselves? We'll talk about that in a bit too. Um, if, if you live contrary to God's will, you will suffer the consequences. That's, that's a phrase my mother used to do, suffer the consequences. <laughs> In her case, it was the hairbrush. Yeah. I remember one time I did something particularly egregious and the hairbrush was being applied and the head broke off the handle. <laughs> and then she was mad at me for breaking her hairbrush. Right. So in John's teaching that the reason this gets hammered over and over and over again in so many different visions and so many different ways is the worst thing you can do is go wandering off to some other God. Please don't do that. John is begging people, stay with the one who created you and who loves you and do not sell that God out for another. The consequences like that smoke last forever and ever. Right Now let's talk about the consequences and how we get there from here. We've talked about free will in, in previous classes, and John alludes to that. He doesn't preach about that. Um, but God's giving a free will to you means that you get to make decisions in life. God's not going to force you to worship God, right? Or to repent or to go to church on Sunday or any of those things. Those become your choices of free will. So, any consequences that come from choosing something other than God are consequences that you've imposed on yourself. John has told you, God has communicated to you through John, that there's going to be horrible consequences that don't end. If you choose to go that way, that's what happens. Now, choose. I just wish that he'd use some other name. <laughs> other than John? Right. <laughs> I can't help you. Call him Johannes, as, a, as it is in Greek. We'll try that. Because God's not going to, God, as, as destructive as you might be to your own self by making poor choices, God's not going to violate your freedom, your freedom to choose your own. Right? Now, let's suppose... The tribulation happens or the God comes and it's time for the sickle and everybody's harvested. And let's suppose hmm, a minute after that, you say, oh, God, oh, God, I I, I, I want to repent now. Is it too late? Is it ever too late with God? Is there any more time? We don't know how that plays out. And you know, when is the last moment you can repent? And if you'd want to think sequentially, there's no answer to that. There's been a lot of things in the Bible about instant repentance. Yeah. I mean, look at the at the, uh, the guy that was uh, on the cross with Jesus. Yes. 
Yeah, and Jesus told many parables to illustrate he, exactly that. Uh, you know, I was instant, instantly that, that he made a mistake. Yeah. That he, he, he wanted to believe in God. Well, what I'm trying to say here is, let's say you made tragic choices and you have eternally bad consequences. Does that last forever and ever? Or are the worst of consequences your eternal separation from God? Is there anything worse than that? Fire? Getting smashed? We'll talk about getting smashed in a few verses. What's worse than being separated from God forever? And that's the consequences of you turning your back and going another way. You know, we are told God is a just God. Mm -hmm. Which means he will administer justice. Right. So it's up to him to decide what justice gets administered for that last bit of plea. Right. He's the final judge. That's right. And, you know, is there a minute after the last minute? <laughs> yeah. It, again, in God's realm, there is no time, right? <laughs> Maybe, but that's his call. In the meantime, you have some calls to make, right? Well, it's kind of hard to believe sometimes. Oh, absolutely. God, he, he's going to say, well, it must, God, it must have been that way. That must have been what he wanted to do. But faith is always hard to believe. I mean, How easy is it to believe that a dead man rose, walked the earth for 50 days, and then in front of the sight of hundreds, was raised up into heaven? Is that in, that anybody seen that in their lifetime in this room? You have to take that on faith. You have to take that as, yeah, as a matter of belief. That on faith, that's what God did. Yeah. And that's that's not easy. That's what faith, that's the center of the Christian faith. I, I don't know. I mean... Okay. Well, let's finish up the chapter here. Um, whoops. My page turn. Okay. Verse 14 to the end. John writes, Then I looked. And a white cloud appeared, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. He had a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple, shouting in a loud voice to the one seated on the cloud, Use your sickle and start to reap, because the time to reap has come, since the earth's harvest is ripe. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Another angel who was in charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to the angel who had the sharp sickle, Use your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes off the vine of the earth, because its grapes are now ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the grapes from the vineyard of the earth and tossed them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Then the winepress was stomped outside the city, and blood poured out of the winepress up to the height of a horse's bridle for a distance of almost 200 miles. Boy, that sounds right to me. Isn't that comforting? <laughs> let's, let's say some things. What we have here are two scenes of judgment uh, put together in the passage I just read to you. You may see them as two different paragraphs in your Bibles. Um, the second one, verses 17 through 20, is clearly a, a word of judgment on the wicked, right? Um, we're putting the wicked as depicted as grapes, putting them in the wine press and making mush out of them. That's a lot of grapes. It's a lot of grapes, <laughs> five feet high and 200 miles in uh, radius. That's a, that's a lot of, well, let's just call them grapes. That's a better way to do it. But the first one in verse 14 through 16, I think, is a little more interesting, right? It, it's about divine judgment. And it goes a bit to what C.T. was talking about earlier. Uh, is it the judgment of the wicked or is it the ingathering of the faithful? And you remember back the parable that Jesus told of the wheats and the weeds. And they leave them alone. We'll gather them both in at the same time. Is it maybe a flavor like that? With one swipe of the sickle, all of them are being taken care of, some in gathered and some cut off for the eternal fire. Right? The will of God. So the question here is who's being harvested in that 
uh, passage, uh, verses 14 through 16. Is it the righteous, the wicked, or both? Now, that's I tend to think it's both. Now, again, the verses that follow is clearly the wicked in that grapes um, analogy. So you've got two different visions that are side by side here. It teaches us something about the value of symbols as John uses them, right? They can mean more than one thing. I mean, we want to do these things and say, ah, I know what that means. But sometimes it's much more squishy than that. It can mean several things at once. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, it's what happens when you teach this three times. You get stupid stuff in your head. Uh, so the symbols can be positive, negative, and sometimes both at the same time, right? They can be gathered together. So in this case, it may well be that the faithful are ingathered at the same time the wicked are being judged. And I say time as a because I don't have another frame of reference as a, as a human being on earth, right? So we have these things all put together. So yes, CT, you just well, got to go. I'm, I'm sorry. You know, you're okay. This, but they've been through the tribulation with this final. Or is this the tribulation? Is the sickle the tribulation? Which would make it instantaneous and painless, so that doesn't make any sense. At least it's sharp, right? You know, and then you go back to, and he shall come again to judge both of quick the living and the dead right so are the dead involved in, or could be but don't know I, I faithful you don't know what you're doing i mean forget the concept of time in your faith right you know you die and you don't know how you did in terms of your faith until this final moment when the living and the dead together are swiped with this green yeah. yeah, and and we've had other visions too. We've had those who have died before with the martyrs in heaven and the 144,000. Are they martyrs again or are they? You know, what? This is when you fall back on what Jesus said, unless you have the faith of a child. I, I, to me, it's pretty simple. You know? If I, I know, and, and we humans want to do that. You're, I know your mind is a former military man. You want to be very organized and very uh, precise about how things line up. Um, yeah, sure it worked, but right, <laughs> but but if if you if if you try to take that military mindset that yeah. you and I share and apply it to Revelation, you'll drive yourself nuts because you can't get there from here, yeah. right? Okay, so That's just why we have faith, right? Truly, <laughs> Professor. Yes, we can't figure it all out. That's right. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> Professor. I seem to have read somewhere that Martin Luther said. A, that any book that calls itself Revelations ought to reveal something like we didn't have a read. <laughs> Am I misquoting him? Or I'm not familiar with that quote, but it sounds an awful lot like him. He did not like this book of the Bible um, for much of his life. I can't lie. It's too hard yeah, to he he mollified his views a little bit in his later years, but he was he famously said, um, "This book should not be in the Bible because Christ cannot be found in it." And and then he he backed off of that much later in his life, um, and he didn't like the book of James either because it, it looked like a lot of work righteousness to him. So it, it but that just illustrates you know, all of us will find things we like or don't like or things we can identify or not. The same was true of Luther. Okay, so just to try to wrap something of a bow on this tonight, we we know these hundred forty four thousand. And the panta, the all of that, is intended to give us comfort and assurance. With the dragons and the beasts loose, understand that God has prepared a place for you, all of you. And that place is glorious and joyous and worshipful, right? So those who follow the Lamb, even those who are martyred, that they go through the worst that this world has to offer, will share in Christ's eternal kingdom. That's the promise we proclaim at every single funeral or memorial service or celebration of life, whatever you want to call those things when we say goodbye to our dear, dearly departed. But some, as I pointed out, have struggled to hear that message, given the imagery that John uses in places here. Um, that verse four that I showed you earlier, especially for many women, causes a great deal of trouble. And they're heard as... By one woman theologian, I wrote, I read, excuse me, as degrading or abusive. 
And those are the years by which she hears it. And, and she's entitled to that. I can't criticize her for that because I don't have the ears of a woman. And, and not all women are going to agree on that. And that's fair too. And, and what she hears is only men are among those 144,000. And, and women's bodies are depicted as capable somehow of defiling them. And again, if you read it from the, with just the black ink on the page, that's what it says. Didn't Christ say that in the kingdom, there's no men, there's one old women, there's no slaves, there's no free, everybody's the same? Yes. So, and I like the phrase, the Bible informs the Bible. In, in my reading of it, again, I'm male, I can't put myself in, in to qualify this, but as a male, that's the way I see things. And, and some females see it that way and some don't. And I'll just acknowledge that and not in any way belittle anybody, no matter which way they think. We just have to be sensitive to that, so. Right. Well, there seems to be a lot of things in this day and age that women are smarter than men anyway. That's not new. <laughs> that was the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, women have been smarter than men. Well, with the exception of that apple thing in the garden, the rest, of course, he wasn't real bright. He did what he was told, right? So, anyhow. He, he got made a straight. Anyhow, the, the last thing I'll say of that is, is, is some will take that passage early in, in uh, chapter 14 as women being displaced or pushed aside and only male images are being shown in heaven um, and so that it may be spotless. And that that's that's harmful for some to read, especially somebody who hasn't been in the church long, hasn't been a Bible scholar at all, and they they take it for the uh, first shot across the bow. Imagine somebody sixteen years old coming to that for the first time; might be pretty tough on them. Yeah. Um, lots of meaning in chapter fourteen. Lots of things below the surface, and and things of um cultural nature from 2000 years ago some of those meanings john intends some of those meanings we read into it or the spirit helps us or drops us into in our own time and in our own uh way and and so those meanings become every bit as real even if john never imagined them right and as i, I shot my own bottom line in the in the tail earlier those who have ears to hear sometimes hear different things from others. Did you ever think that maybe God gets upset with us trying to second guess him? Yeah. I, I don't I think God is forgiving. He knows. <laughs> now John isn't consistently negative about women. He certainly is in the images of chapter 14. But in chapter 12, if you remember back, there was the woman who, you know, in the Python um uh, myth ripoff, if you will. We had the woman and the child and, and you know, the God that saves her from the dragon and those things. That woman represented all the people of the church. Very positive. Chapter 19 we'll get to will be the faithful bride of Christ. Another image of, of women used that's very positive. Are, are these things somehow counterbalancing one another? Who's to say? I, I'm not going to be the judge of that. But John isn't always using the, the negative image of women, to be sure. No, I didn't. Okay, well, let's let's take the, let's not look at women now, let's look at sexuality, okay? Um, should we take what John used of that, literally? Um, those relations, sexual, human sexual relations were seen as defiling in that same place. And I went through, excuse me, the Uriah and Bathsheba and David uh, scenario on that. Um, do we take that literally? Is that what that really means? Again, legend of Century Tower. <laughs> um, There's too many places in the Bible that seem to uh, deny that. Right, right. And we'll get to that in just a moment. The background for holy war is something I talked about. Men abstain from sex in order to perform better in battle. And that stands behind this too. You've heard me say that. Um, 
this should not literally be taken as negative comments on human sexuality. God says something very different, very consistently in the biblical record. Nor is it a call for celibacy. These 144,000 that were virgins, God does not call us all to be virgins. Uh, not in any literal sense at all. The biblical tradition is very strong. What is the first commandment? As you start reading the, from the front cover of the Bible, what's the first commandment given to the humans by God? No, no that's the first and given to Moses. Be fruitful and multiply, right? So God is, and God doesn't give that once. He gives it a number of times. He gives it again after Noah and his family survived the flood, right? So there's a number of times where be fruitful and multiply is God's first command. And so sexual relations is not something God frowns upon by any means. The Apostle Paul is one who did espouse celibacy. We, we have to recognize that. But he espoused it for himself. And he, when he spoke um, of others, he said, yes, husbands and wives uh, should share one another with themselves. And this was very important. It was just something he chose for himself that he found spiritually uplifting, not a prescription for all to go to heaven by any means. And then there's that passage 9 through 20 with the wine press and and even before that with the smoke forever, right? Um, that's about as condensed a, a whole series of punishment texts as anywhere in the Bible certainly anywhere in Revelation even. So these, uh, these things are very concentrated, as I said, and statements about these torment and the damned with vivid imagery are just before us as we read that. The wine press is the one I can't let go of with the ooze five feet deep and miles around, right? It's, oh. Some, some look at that and they say, I... You know, Luther didn't like this book, but others don't like it either for perhaps just saying that kind of vindictive uh, violence is just not Christian. Where do you, do you find Christ in that? Yeah, and, and, and people have that criticism of that passage. Um, yeah, I'm not trying to excuse it, but as I said, apocalypses were written for 400 years. The one, uh, the apocalypse of John that we're sharing tonight um, was written somewhere in the middle of that 400 years. Um, some of them are far worse in their, in their violence. This is bad. Don't get me wrong. Some of them are far, far worse. And what John does do, if you notice, is he avoids having the faithful standing there and watching it and cheering it all on and feeling vindicated by it. You notice the faithful aren't even there when that occurs? In John's telling... Only the angels and the lamb witness that wine press thing going on. Right. So he's a, he's a bit different, but still, it's shocking to us. Yes, Steve. Well, I was just thinking, you know, uh, I don't myself take that literally, you know, just crushing people and having their blood flow and everything. I mean, I, like most people, I guess, wrestle with this concept of... Thank you, that's my next sentence. <laughs> you know, wrestle with this concept of heaven and hell. You know, the, the lake of fire. Right. And anyhow, in my silly mind, I have come to terms that... And you mentioned this earlier, too. It seems like to me that somewhere in the universe, in the eternity, there... Two populations of cognizant beings, you know, one are the ones who never wanted God, never wanted to accept Christ, and they're, then they're the faithful who love Christ. And my goodness, I always thought that if the two were aware of the presence of these different groups, I mean, if you were in there with the likes of Hitler and all these murders and everything, you knew that all, oh, maybe a lot of your friends were in the other group. I mean, wouldn't that be hell? I can't think of a worse hell than being stuck with a bunch of reprobates and knowing, well, there's paradise off over there, but guess what you chose? 
You know, you chose. You did it to yourself. And still, that would be hell in my mind. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you, I, do, you, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't have to accept literally a lake of fire. I'm burning. Right. And smoke and all that. That nope. would be hell. No, there's too many images. They can't all be true anyway, right? Yeah. So, so these aren't literal things. They're they're meant to convey meaning. This is, we talk about rhetoric. Paul gave us uh, the ultimate in Roman rhetoric and his speaking. This is picture rhetoric that is being given to us. And, and similar points are being made, but in a way we're not used to, right? And Again, he's speaking to churches, people in the churches, and he wants to shock us into, remember some of these churches were lukewarm in their faith? He's trying to get them off a dead center and get them boiling hot for their faith again. That's his, that's his modus operandi here, right? Those half-hearted Christians who might go down the road because they're having a great barbecue at the, at the altar of the pagan god, don't go there. Here's why. He's trying to teach him, and he's trying to really teach him with, with uh, how do we used to teach about drunk driving? You know, we used to have those films of crash victims and everything. Oh, he's he's teaching in that kind of manner to people who would, yeah. yeah we, a lot of us had to suffer through those, right? <laughs> so we have to remember, this is addressed to people like us, not those heathens out there. This is lessons for us. Right? And how always has been. And so going out there and, and mixing in with the local pagans that, you know, live in the neighborhood, not a good idea. If, if you're trying to introduce them to the gospel, that's one thing. But if you're going there to take part in, in the pagan cult or in the neighborhood around you, that's entirely different. But don't we see Christians doing almost that? Yes. Today. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's that's precisely my point. It's always yeah. been a problem since Christ's ascension. Yeah. I think it's getting worse. We're conforming to the world instead of being transformed by the renewing of our heart, mind, soul. Beautifully said. Thank you. Well, it seems like to me that God made a mistake when he gave us the ability to think for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> You two should have a discussion about that when you see God. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to criticize him over that. Well, and I think about all the mistakes I've made. I can't blame God for them. All right. Well, I'll, I'll leave you this with this quote as my last thought tonight from a, a theologian named Sweet. He writes, John uses pictures as Jesus used parables. I, I never thought of it in that way, but it really is right. As Jesus used parables to ram home the unimaginable disaster of rejecting God and the unimaginable blessedness of union with God, while there is still time to do something about it. Right. And that's it, it, in chapter 14 and much of Revelation. That's that's John's central thought. And I, I leave you that with that thought. To go home for the next week, right? Uh, next time, next week, look at, we'll breeze through chapters 15 and 16 and, and ask yourself if, if the things that happen on earth are really connected to things that happen in heaven and vice versa. Did God make two separate creations or are they connected in some way? Do they work together in some way? And that, that thought may cross your mind as you read these two chapters. And uh, you're going to hear the bowl plagues. There's going to be seven of them, like all the plague sets. There'll be seven bowl plagues. Um, and, and how does that inform your understanding of how God loves and cares for his creation? And as we get to the, through these plagues, they all get a little bit more mm -hmm, disastrous than the ones before. So um, that question would come to mind. Okay. Well, and meeting next week. Right? Yes, we are. We will be here next week. At least I will be here next week <laughs> with my camera. <laughs> so that's the 20th, unless you want to talk me out of it. Um, but we're going to miss uh, two weeks after that. So um, we'll be here on the uh, 17th and 20th for uh, our 12th installment. Then we'll have two weeks off. Now, um, so next week, we won't really need. I'm sorry. 15 and 16. Correct. Correct. Next week. And then, uh, of course, Christmas Eve, I, uh, we're not going to have class. And New Year's Eve, 
I'm preaching. <laughs> so we're not having class then either. So we will be back uh, the first two uh, Sundays or Wednesdays of January. <clears throat> Actually, second Wednesday of January. All righty. Okay, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, come and be with us. Come and be with us and uh, give us a little nudge. Yes, you give us free will. You allow us to make choices of who our God is. But send your spirit to give us a little nudge so that we are wise with our choice. May we always choose to follow you and may we always push away the other things that entice us in this world with their sexual uh, allure and uh, their promise to be gods of the moment. So may we push them all away, whether they're figurines or their fame or fortune or whatever they may be. And Lord God, may we always fall toward you. May we always turn toward you. May we always come to the gospel of Jesus Christ and be faithful to the powerful leading of your Holy Spirit. And take us home this evening safe in the weather and safe in all things we do in the coming week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.